Good morning. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. Under the leadership of the Capuchin Franciscan Friars and in union with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Philadelphia, St. John's welcomes all who are present with us today in praising God and serving God's people. There will be a young adult outreach Wednesday, December 14th at 6.30 p.m. Prayer and reflection called Waiting, an Advent theme and Christian reality. Kara Coons will be the speaker and the program will be in the parish center. For many years on Christmas Eve, Holy Redeemer children have gone to the nursing home and rehab facility at 16th and Lombard Streets. The name of the facility has changed over the years and is, it is now called Pro Medica. The children will sing Christmas carols and give each resident a wrapped Christmas gift. Simple gifts are appreciated. Word puzzle books, adult coloring books, decks of cards, stuffed animals, uh, 2023 calendars with pictures, socks, warm scarves, or lap blankets. Please consider buying a few gifts, wrapping them, and marking them M, F, or E for male, female, or either. Gifts will be collected in boxes in the upper and lower churches. The annual St. John's Christmas concert will be in the upper church and will feature our own St. John's choir and facility and faculty and alumni of the University of the Arts. In addition to our usual Wednesday to Saturday schedule of confessions, St. John's Church will offer two communal penance services with individual confession of sins and absolution. Mark your calendars for December 20th and 21st at 12.30 p.m. St. John's owes the Archdiocese about $800,000 for work done some years ago to the church and for other bills that we were not able to pay. Over the past few years, we have been making significant payments on our debt. Our parish council has agreed that we should have a monthly second collection to pay down our debt. Please be generous next weekend, December 17th to 18th. As we are about to begin Mass, please turn off or silence all cell phones or any other device that may cause disruption or distraction. Our opening hymn is number 44, O Come Divine Messiah, 44. Please stand. So 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. So today we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent, which is known as Gaudete Sunday. The word Gaudete is a Latin command, rejoice. And the readings on this Sunday always have a theme of rejoicing because while we wait for the Messiah on this Sunday, we say, well, the Messiah is still coming. We're still waiting, but he's near. Christmas is near. Salvation is near. The, the Messiah is near. So it's this breaking in of joy in the midst of waiting. Today we also welcome our, our friends from Waldron Mercy Academy. Uh, we don't often have children here, and we like to have children here. So everybody, we have to be on our best behavior because we want them to come back. So we're going to try to do our best to impress you today so that you'll come back again and again and join us for, for Mass as we celebrate with the Lord. So today on this uh, feast of this, this Gaudete Sunday, as I said, we, we, we have joy because all the blessings of God are coming, including the most precious blessing of all, which is forgiveness of our sins. That's the ultimate reason Jesus came, so that we would not be burdened by sin. Let's call to mind our sins, and let's call to mind God's mercy. how your people faithfully await the feast of the Lord's nativity. Enable us, we pray, to attain the joys of so great a salvation and to celebrate them always with solemn worship and glad rejoicing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Please be seated. Andrew will come up for our first reading. If you'd like to follow along in the books, uh, the first reading, the reading can be for today's Mass can be found on page 38. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The desert and the preached land will, will exult. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will, give, will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication, with the divine recompense. He comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared, and will the lame of the leap with a stag. The, then the tongue of the mute will sing. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowded with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Save us, Lord, 
God keeps faith forever, secures justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets captives free. Lord, come and save us. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord raises up those who were bowed down. The Lord loves the just. The Lord protects strangers. Lord, come and save us. The fatherless and the widow he sustains. But the way of the wicked he thwarts. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, through all generations. Lord, come and save. come forward for the second reading now. A reading from the letter of St. James. Be, pati be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You too must be patient. Make your hearts firm because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, about one another, that you might not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the gates. Take it as an example of hardship and patience, brothers and sisters, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, the word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of the Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them, and blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. 
This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. So last week and today we hear about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was faithful to what God wanted him to do. He appeared in the desert in a hostile environment. Last week we heard that he was dressed with rough clothing. He had animal skins, camel skins wrapped around his his body. And he ate locusts, insects, bugs, and wild honey. And John the Baptist came telling people, get ready because the Messiah is already here. He's about to be revealed. And John the Baptist, his preaching was about warning. You'd better watch out because when the Messiah comes, oh, you aren't going to like what he's going to do to you. You know, in some ways it's like the, 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 the TV mom who says to the kids, wait till your father gets home. Now, in my family, we were not afraid of our father. We were afraid of our mother. <laughs> so, and um, in fact, my father was afraid of our mother too. So, we, my mother could never, <clears throat> my mom could, my mom couldn't make that threat, nor would she ever have made that threat. But, but John the Baptist is saying, "Wait till the Messiah gets here. He is going to be like a, a a reaper who winnows the the the, the wheat, and he's going to put the wheat to this side and the chaff that side." and the chaff will be burned in unquenchable fire, and you're the chaff. He called the people brood of vipers. I had a children's mass at, uh, at Holy Redeemer this week, brood of vipers. Now, brood means children. You're the children of snakes, he told the people. So John the Baptist had a strong message, and then John the Baptist told King Herod, you're wrong because you have married your brother's wife. That's wrong. Now, then and now, it's not a good idea to to tell somebody in power that they're wrong. Uh, Today, you might get away with it in the United States, but then you didn't get away. He got put to prison. So here he is now in prison. Have you ever visited a prison? I visited plenty of prisons in the United States. And once I visited a prison in Papua New Guinea, the prisons in the United States are nicer than the prisons in Papua New Guinea. But I think the prison at the time of John the Baptist was worse even than a Papua New Guinea prison. He was in a terrible place, in a dungeon, and John knew where it was going to end. He knew that he would not leave that prison alive. And so here he is sitting in the dark, sitting in dampness, rats around him, waiting for his death. And he starts to look at his life and wonder, what was it all about? What was it about? Did I do anything worthwhile? He has lots of time to think. And he's hearing about Jesus. He, He had already decided that Jesus was the Messiah, but now he's hearing about Jesus. Remember, he told the people, when the Messiah comes, he is going to really, really be tough. But he's not hearing about Jesus being all that tough. Jesus isn't screaming a message of uh, of judgment and wrath. And so John the Baptist is in prison saying, "Um, was my life for nothing? Did I miss something? Did I misinterpret this moment? And did I misinterpret God? And maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe I was wrong. My, My nephew joined the Marines and went to Iraq. And uh, right before he went, we had a little bit of a party for, for my nephew. And then after the party, we went to a bar. And in my family, my siblings don't drink. I'm, I'm the fun uncle, so I, I went out to the bar with my nephew and some of his friends. And my nephew, my nephew survived Iraq, just so you know, there's no bad ending to this story. But my nephew uh, said to me, Uncle Tom, if I die in Iraq, you'll be the priest at my funeral, surely. And he said, you tell everybody that I died to bring freedom to the people of Iraq. 
Well, I was touched. My nephew, you know, proud, you know. He wasn't there very long before he decided that, what was I thinking? This isn't worthwhile. I'm not doing a good thing here. He, He turned his mind after he got there and he saw what it was really like. So, John the Baptist is in a similar situation. He, he gave his life for something, and now he's wondering whether he chose rightly. So he sends his disciples to Jesus to say, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He tells John through, the, through his disciples, look what I'm doing. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear the good news. Go back and tell John that. Of course, John was a man who was thoroughly rooted in in the Old Testament. And John recognized in in the deeds of Jesus predictions from the Old Testament. The the part we read today from Isaiah that, that Andrew read to us. Those kind of predictions are there. But when the Messiah comes, these wonderful things will happen. Now, John the Baptist never performed miracles. He preached. He threatened. He baptized for the forgiveness of sins. But he didn't do any miracles. And Jesus preached and did miracles. A lot of miracles. A lot of healings. Jesus ministry was different from John the Baptist. So John the Baptist would have recognized in the words of Jesus that Jesus was fulfilling at least some of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Now there are different images of God in the Bible and the way that we understand the Bible is we 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 have to interpret one part of the Bible in light of another part of the Bible and we can't just cherry pick the parts of the Bible we like and ignore the rest. But if you want a harsh and pitiless God who will hurt bad people, you can find that God in the Bible. And if you want a nice God who is full of mercy, you can also find that God in the Bible. So sometimes there are different perspectives on God within the Bible. And as I said, we can't read one part of the Bible alone. We have to read the whole scripture to understand, as best we can, who God is. Now, be clear, be clear. Jesus affirmed the ministry of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus, and Jesus pointed to his merciful healings, his merciful ministry, his special special outreach to the poor, Jesus didn't say John the Baptist was a good guy, but boy, did he get it wrong. In fact, Jesus affirmed the hard words of John the Baptist. He said that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born. He said that John the Baptist was a prophet and that John the Baptist was um, speaking the truth about God. Jesus came with a judgment. John the Baptist said when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes, he is going to judge And in fact, Jesus came with a judgment. That was truth. But the judgment of Jesus, the judgment Jesus brought, was not about God's vengeance, but about God's love. What we read, when we read the fullness of the scripture, what we read is that God can be a God of wrath. But God's wrath is not that God just gets so furious with people who do wrong things that he just says, I am going to fry you. God's wrath is the flip side of God's love. Because when God reveals himself as wrathful, he's wrathful for two reasons. Sometimes God's wrath in the Bible is because God can't stand to see a powerful person oppressing a weak person. He can't see, he can't stand it when somebody misuses his or her power to hurt somebody else. Sometimes the wrath of God is about justice. And God is just. He's merciful, but he's just. 
But most often the wrath of God in the Bible is because God can't stand to see people hurting themselves. And the wrath of God is his plea that says, stop hurting yourself. Change your life. The wrath is meant to reform a person so that a person lives a good life. You, you know how it is as parents. You know, you can get pretty angry with your kids. You know, if, I, I was with them, <clears throat> I was with a, a couple, I, I stayed overnight on Friday night to Saturday with a couple with twin boys who are four years old. And then we ended up with a bunch of other friends together. And I said to everybody, Dave and Marissa is the name of the couple, I said, I was impressed by Dave and Marissa because they were so patient with their, their two four-year-olds. I mean, the kids got cranky, the kids got whiny, the kids got demanding, you, you, you know, they, they're bad kids. No, you know how kids are. They, they can get that way, you know. Not these Waldron kids. No. But so these kids were, 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 were kind of, you know, they were kids. And I said to everybody, Dave and Marissa, they're, they're ideal parents. They were so patient with their kids. They said, Father, that's because you were there. <laughs> If you hadn't been there, they, I said, well, the kids should want me there all the time then because if you're on your best behavior because I'm there. But yes, God wants the best for us. And so sometimes the best for us is that God would correct us and change us. But the preeminent sign of the presence of God and the coming of the Messiah is mercy. Mercy. It's kindness. It's not judgment and wrath, but it's God's healing power. It's God's healing. So when jo Jesus is telling John the Baptist, I am the Messiah, I am fulfilling what God wants, he, he, he's really saying to him, yes, John, you, you understood a part about God's way, but I'm, I'm here... To, I, Jesus is the word, the word, the fullness of God's revelation. And he's saying that I come, yes, with challenge, but I come with mercy and kindness and acceptance and healing. John seemed to be urging the Messiah to come with a harsh, even violent judgment. And throughout history, and even today, so sometimes Christians have taken that as the preeminent or primary mode of God in the world. And, and, and Jesus is telling us that's not it. John lived in the desert. Jesus points out that John lived in the desert, not dressed in fine clothes. John lived in the desert in poverty and, and simplicity and austerity. And Jesus is saying here... Uh, the way of God is not the way of power and wealth. And, and, and too often in the history of the church, um, p the church has been seduced to believe that, that it could do the most good in the world if it possessed the world's power and wealth. And that's been the uh, fundamental uh, error that the church has committed through the centuries, is to believe that if only we had power and wealth, if only we could impose the gospel on people for their own good we could make the world better and John the Baptist came with no power no wealth Jesus came with no power no wealth John and Jesus both lived with no power no wealth they both lived humbly and simply but their words thunder through the centuries both John's words of correction and judgment and Jesus words of mercy although Jesus had his own words of judgment too but the story of Jesus and John, his, his precursor, their story lasts through the centuries. And all those Christians who thought, all those popes, all those bishops who thought, if only we had power and wealth, like the world, what good we could do. Their, their, their way of being Christian vaporizes. It, it passes like mist. So the real question today is what kind of follower of Jesus are you? Does your life reflect, first of all, integrity, like John, that you don't do the wrong thing, you don't cower before those who are powerful, you don't, you don't live to please 
others, to curry favor with others, that you, you do what's right and you stand up for what's right, the way John taught, are you that kind of person? And the second question is, are you the kind of person as Jesus is? Do you have a place? Jesus said he preached the good news to the poor. Do you have a place in your life for the poor? Do you have time for those who are lonely and those who are abandoned, those who don't? Do, do you really, really make time for people who need your time? Do you have mercy for sinners, people who make mistakes? Do you have a heart for the weak and the vulnerable? Do you really? These are the questions that the ministry of John and the ministry of Jesus pose to us. During Advent, uh, jumping ahead, please stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. During Advent, the church waits with hope for the saving power of God. As we pray for what we need, we pray with confidence in God's love. With faith, let us now offer our prayers. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That the church will lead people to hope in God's mercy and love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That elected and appointed government officials will promote peace, defend human dignity, and care for the poor and the vulnerable, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who grieve for deceased or absent loved ones, that they will find consolation this Advent and Christmas seasons. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Christians who are harassed or persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, that they will find absolution and mercy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all benefactors of St. John's Church, the intentions in our book of prayer, and for those intentions that each of us now offers in silence. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Now let's ask our Blessed Mother to pray with us today as we sing, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Amen. And all these prayers we present to God our Father through Christ our Lord. Our offertory hymn is number 67, Maranatha, 67.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice and your hearts for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and good of all of his holy church. May the sacrifice of our worship, Lord, we pray, be offered to you unceasingly to complete what was begun in sacred mystery and powerfully accomplish for us your saving work. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago and opened for us the way to eternal salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which we now dare to hope. And so, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he. In the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many. 
for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. John the Evangelist, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Nelson, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit.
Let's now greet each other with a sign of God's peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Our communion hymn is number 48, Beyond the Moon and Stars, 48.
mercy, Lord, that this divine sustenance may cleanse us of our faults and prepare us for the coming feast through Christ our Lord. I just want to highlight one of the announcements we heard before Mass, and that is at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we have our annual Christmas concert here in the Upper Church. So if you want to go shopping and eating, and you're looking for something Christmassy to do this afternoon, come back and, and listen to some music from our choir and from our, um, our alumni uh, and, and faculty from the University of the Arts. So come back at 2 if you can. And also, I want to once again uh, thank the, our friends from Waldron Mercy Academy for coming here. Is this your first and last time to come here? No, you're going to come back, right? Good, good. We, we really want them to come back. Um, and and uh, what I'd like to suggest is maybe after the Mass, you all could stay for a photograph with me. I can come back. So I'll walk to the back and I'll come right back up and we can have a photograph. And if you, if you have a parish you're going to every Sunday, that's wonderful. Keep going there. But if you're looking for a parish, you know, consider St. John, Center City, the heart of the city here. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is number 39, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. 39. 